We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Adam Gaia and Emily Johnson. Adam Gaia is with Rising Tide Seattle, and Emily Johnston is with 350 Seattle. And we're going to be talking about the uh, the fossil fuels uh, dilemma here in the Seattle and Washington State and worldwide. So, Adam and Emily, thank you both for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thank you, Mike. So let's start out, and uh, if you could each. Talk a little bit about your respective organizations. Emily, if you'd start out first. Sure. Um, 350, the national organization, was started by Bill McKibben and a bunch of students from Middlebury College in Vermont uh, several years ago. And they started it because none of the big environmental groups were focused exclusively on climate change. Uh, and Bill, as you may know, wrote the first layperson's book about climate change back in 89 called The End of Nature. Um, and so he basically became disturbed enough after that that he it became a major focus f for him. Um, and they started the group. And it's got uh, in all sorts of international affiliates, uh, uh, I think, on every continent except Antarctica, of course. Um, and uh, we started the group locally, about uh, a dozen of us, uh, in Seattle just last May um, and many of us had been activists with other environmental groups or on our own um, but we got started just in May and the the the, the focus of both the national and the local group, you know, is just to bring public attention to issues around um, climate change and climate uh, justice. All right, Adam. Oh. Um, well, I work with the Seattle chapter, our collective of the Rising Tide Network. Uh, Rising Tide is a global, all-volunteer, grassroots network dedicated to confronting the root causes of climate change, which we see as both um, systems of oppression, um, political and economic systems that our society has structured, which drive the fossil fuel industry, and incorporating a climate justice framework into the environmental community. Um, so it's a, it's a global network with uh, collectives all across the world. It was started actually by activists in Europe and Australia. There are strong rising tide chapters across the globe. Um, and here in Seattle in North America, um, we are uh, a collective that works largely around fossil fuel infrastructure projects and building power through uh, direct action and civil disobedience to build the grassroots movement to tackle climate change in North America. So what is climate justice? Thanks so much for asking. That's a great question, Mike. Uh, so climate justice is the concept that those who are most impacted by both climate change and the fossil fuel extraction and burning, which leads to climate change, are the people that are least empowered to take action, to respond to, or adapt to those. So that climate change in and of itself is a social, economic, and racial issue. Uh, so that's from the fact that you know the people whom are being displaced from their homes from climate-related disasters largely come from the global south or come from economically or politically marginalized communities to here in the United States. If you live next to a refinery and are breathing toxic air from the refining or if you're like to a coal-fired power plant, um, you are far more likely to be of a low-income community, a community of color, a marginalized community. Uh, so those folks really need to be represented in the conversation around climate change and how we respond to it and actually be given positions of leadership and look to when we're looking at how to solve the problem of climate change. Uh, it also is a rejection of a lot of the big corporate solutions to climate change which ignore these frontline communities or marginalized communities. So for example, one of the solutions to the energy crisis in Southern Europe that's been proposed as a climate friendly solution is building massive solar farms across of North Africa and displacing dozens of local communities. So we see these kind of big corporate solutions to climate change that don't actually respond with a justice framework and look at the impacted communities to be really problematic. Uh, and so we're trying to bring that into the conversation of climate change and actually make it a central focus so that as we move towards a more stable climate and as we move towards a world um, with a stable temperature, we actually do that in a way that is just and sustainable for all peoples. Mm. So you believe we actually will move towards a more uh, stable climate? Um, the work that we're doing and the movement that we're building is really inspiring to me. Uh, I believe that, yes, we can definitely accomplish that. 
So, um, the Keystone XL pipeline has been getting a lot of uh, new uh, news coverage lately, um, but you guys uh, both are working with your respective organizations and pointing out that there's there's numerous projects besides that uh, that are especially here in Washington State that will impact us directly. So I'm wondering, can you briefly? talk about the developments with the Keystone XL and then maybe expand on that and talk about some of the other uh, projects that are going to affect us? You well, want to start that, Emily? Sure. Um, so uh, Keystone XL is a, a very big deal and a very big problem, and it's what brought a lot of people into the movement. Um, uh, and uh, so we've been trying to focus attention on Keystone XL, and uh, we're both part of the Pledge of Resistance to Keystone XL, uh, in which about 78,000 people nationally pledged to either um, risk uh, arrest or to support those risking arrest if it looks as though uh, Keystone is going to be approved. Um, but at the same time, here in the Northwest, we're really at the choke point for all the fossil fuel that, that the uh, fossil fuel companies want to leave North America and and export. So the projects that are currently on the table for uh, infrastructure projects for coal and oil in Washington and Oregon alone add up to three times the carbon pollution of Keystone XL. So we can't take our eye off the ball of the local fight either because it's huge. And, and that's gotten a lot less uh, public attention. Um, and, and therefore, we see it as our job in a lot of ways to just keep bringing that up and keep pointing out to people. So the uh, Power Pass Coal Coalition and other uh, and related activist groups um, did a good job of putting the coal trains on the table and telling people about that. The oil trains are much uh, a much more recent phenomenon just in the last year and a half or so um, and and they also are a really big deal um, so th you know there are three uh, trains through Seattle every week now um, of this Bach and shale oil and that's the stuff that's been exploding all over the uh, continent you know they're for first in Lac Megantic in uh, Canada and then pretty much every month since then there's been an explosion and fire um, and if the uh, current proposals on the table are approved, there will then be um, 24 of those trains coming through downtown Seattle every single week, uh, right by um, uh, Quest Field um, and uh, CenturyLink, and um, you know where 71,000 people are gathered, uh, and and these things are incredibly explosive. It's super dangerous. So there's a you know many many reasons you know from the carbon pollution to the immediate dangers. Uh, people really need to know about this, and they you know need to um, we need to stop it basically. And going back to Keystone, just uh, locally, um, so 78,000 people have signed a pledge of resistance to participate in peaceful civil disobedience if the president makes the first steps towards approving the Keystone XL pipeline. A lot of those people are undergoing training and preparation to prepare for those actions right now. About 1,600 people in the city of Seattle and the surrounding area have signed the pledge. And it's definitely not too late to join. If this is an issue that you're particularly concerned about, you can go to nokxl.org and you can sign the Pledge of Resistance there, get connected to local action leaders that are preparing a massive action in Seattle if uh, and only if President Obama moves on the first steps towards approving the Keystone Pipeline. Um, and that step for the purpose of the Pledge of Resistance would be if the State Department determines over the next three months that the pipeline is in the national interest of the country. So they're going to make a determination of national interest in the next three months. And that's what we'll be watching. Uh, but more broadly, I think the thing that Keystone has done for the environmental movement uh, glo nationally that's really interesting is, you know, five, ten years ago, the environmental movement in the United States was really a very Washington, D.C., Beltway-focused movement. It was very much centered around big NGOs, lobbying Congress, lobbying the president around specific action. Uh, there were some grassroots components, but most of the leadership of the movement was in D.C. And what Keystone did was force a lot of those big NGOs to broaden their reach and their scope beyond D.C. and begin taking leadership from communities in 
the heartland and forcing this idea of frontline communities, those immediately facing fossil fuel projects, as being leaders in this fight. So it moved the locus of the leadership of the fight away from D.C. to you know farmers in Nebraska or landowners in Texas who were doing the direct resistance to the construction of the pipeline, who were kind of the communities that were being highlighted to First Nations communities up in Alberta. And it really made this, uh, you know, took the environmental movement from being a D.C. focused issue to really a national movement, to, to a real movement of people. Um, and what Rising Tide has been trying to do with that and with that in mind is to continue that work and continue putting the focus on these local fossil fuel infrastructure fights where there is an actual impacted community, where you can see the tangible impacts that that project is going to have on a community. As we see, that's where the real leadership on climate is coming from. We're not getting much out of our political leaders when it comes to you know a global or a national action. And the real action is coming from local communities standing up and saying, you know, we're sick and tired of these refineries spewing sulfur dioxide into our communities. We're sick and tired of living next to coal-fired power plants or living next to massive um, you know, mountaintop removal sites in West Virginia or having our waters fracked. And that's where the leadership has shifted. Uh, I think the Northwest is a really prime example for that when you look at the resistance to the coal trains and other fossil fuel projects. So uh, that's what I think like the the real lesson and legacy we get from the Keystone fight, no matter which direction it goes. And are those individuals and in, in grassroots responses, are they having significant impact on stopping some of these projects? Well, once again, going back to the Northwest, I think that, yeah, we can look at very direct and tangible results. You know, we started with six coal export proposals. We're now down to is it, is it three now, I believe? Sorry, mm -hmm. these things keep coming online and offline so quickly. Sometimes it's hard to keep track, but we've defeated half of the proposals. Um, you're seeing massive resistance in states like New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania to proposals to open up new lands to fracking. Uh, and a lot of that is not coming in the direct way, in terms of the leadership way, from these Beltway DC groups, but they're coming from local community groups in Philadelphia, local groups in the Marcellus Shale Formation in Ithaca and in upstate New York. Uh, folks, you know, but the coal trains fight was really locused around Bellingham, a community that is, you know, definitely far from the, the DC typical uh, centers of power. Um, but there's also a bigger story going on here in the Northwest that uh, I think, and I think Emily would agree with me that you know 350 and Rising Tide have both been working on that isn't being talked about. Uh, so a lot of attention has been given to these coal trains and to these coal export facilities. There's starting to be some attention about these oil export facilities, which have begun to crop up to take their place. Like I said, these projects keep being proposed and defeated every couple of weeks. So, you know, sometimes it's hard to keep track of what's out there. Um, but we're still often looking at each of these projects or each of these issues in isolation. We had six coal export facilities that were proposed. Now we have 10 oil by rail facilities. Um, and the folks that are working on those are very siloed. When you look at the big picture from British Columbia, the northern end of British Columbia, to the southern tip of Oregon, the Northwest has about 25 or more proposed major fossil fuel projects slated for our coast in the next couple of years. It's a massive transformation. It's just an absolutely mind-boggling number when you look at it. And very few people are talking about the cumulative impacts of all of these projects. Now, that includes um, new terminals to export or refine oil being brought in from the Bakken Shale Formation. That includes these coal export terminals, both in the US and in Canada. That includes 
pipelines to bring uh, tar sands materials from Alberta, both to uh, British Columbia and to Washington refineries. That includes new terminals to load tar sands in Bakken on the barges and tankers and ship it through the Puget Sound. That includes natural gas terminals. So this is a really huge bevy of projects that are headed our way. Um, and when you look at it, that's really the the untold story of, of the cumulative impact of all these projects. Um, it's really a, a, a mind-boggling choice that we're facing because here in the Northwest, uh, we, you know, a lot of us, I mean, I came here three years ago for the quality of life here, for, you know, the wonderful access to nature, the you know beautiful coast that we have. Um, and that's, I think, why a lot of people really love this region and really feel a strong connection to living here. Um, and it's hard to imagine what it would look like living here with 25 major fossil fuel terminals along our coast, hundreds of tankers rolling through the Puget Sound every week, um, and hundreds of trains rolling across our coast carrying the dirtiest and most dangerous fossil fuels on the planet. That would radically transform the region. And the irony of the Northwest being considered one of the greenest places in the country, uh, with that picture that Adam is painting, um, is is enormous. Uh, I mean, the idea, we have, you know, a, a very green mayor. We also have an even greener governor um, who's very focused on climate change. But it doesn't matter what the state plans, you know, for its own carbon emissions. If we're busy shipping um, all of this coal and oil and anything else um, to other countries, you know, it's it's as though we're, you know, uh, not taking the drugs, but we're willing to sell them. Um, uh, and you know, it also so Shell is also uh, it's ships that were getting ready, it's tankers that were getting ready for Arctic drilling um, were based in Seattle, you know, a couple of years ago when they were getting their repairs. Um, and so, it, you know, there again, as a geographical locus, you know, there's all kinds of things going on here that, that are relevant that people aren't necessarily aware of. And, and all of them point to the fact that the fossil fuel companies are basically just incredibly irresponsible. So what Adam was talking about in terms of the increase in tankers, for example, uh, Noah has said, you know, I think it was about five years ago in a report that even a single spill of oil in the Puget Sound would wipe out the um, uh, resident orca population. Even a single spill, and and that's of that was of conventional oil that they were talking about. If there were a spill of tar sands oil, it would be far worse because tar sands bitumen is much heavier and it sinks. Uh, there basically is no way to clean it up when it lands in water. Um, so these are the things that are at risk, and we will be putting these at risk every single, we already are putting them at risk every week. I think there are three tankers now per week, something for, the, for oil sands. Approximately three yeah. tankers a week. And, uh, and there'll be many more. Um, so people need to understand that we, uh, you know, are exporting tons and tons of uh, carbon, carbon pollution, massive amounts of carbon pollution, um, and also the local effects, you know, could uh, be dire with even a single accident. Um, and, you know, as Adam pointed out, this is people come here for the environment you know most people who uh, live here just love the region um, and it needs to you know people need to be aware of this so I wasn't aware there were so many of these projects on the table and potentially uh, becoming a reality within a, a couple of years how do people track these different projects and how do they plug into the different um, grassroots groups that are resisting those well, hopefully that'll become much easier in the next few months. Right now, it's actually quite difficult to keep a handle on all of the different projects, given that they're happening in different jurisdictions. And that's why a lot of people aren't aware of this. Uh, part of it has to do with the way that nonprofits that work on these issues are structured. You only ever hear about these projects or issues in isolation. And that's because if I work for a nonprofit and I'm funded to work on coal export terminals in the Northwest, the only thing I'm going to talk about or be allowed to talk about largely is coal export terminals. If a whole bunch of oil export terminals, that's like a, a crazy idea, a whole bunch of oil export terminals are proposed right next to the coal export terminals I'm working on that have a lot of the same impacts and are going to tie into and have cumulative impacts with my projects, I can talk about them a little bit on the periphery, but for the most part, my funders aren't going to want me to talk about oil because that's a different issue. That's not the work I'm being funded to do. 
The same thing for the folks that are working on natural gas or are working on oil. Um, and it gets even worse when you're crossing that national boundary. The folks up in Canada very, very rarely talk about you know, the projects happening in the United States and the pro folks in the United States very rarely talk about the projects happening in Canada, even though they directly impact one another. The new proposed and expanded coal terminals up in British Columbia would be taking Powder River Basin coal from the United States, the very thing that we're trying to keep in the ground by stopping coal export terminals in the US. Those trains would roll from you know Montana and Wyoming through Seattle, through Bellingham on their way to these terminals up in British Columbia. Those pipelines up in Vancouver, the one they're trying to triple, this Kinder Morgan pipeline that they'd like to triple the size of and bring up to about 860,000 barrels of tar sands, bring almost, or I believe, approximately 400 tar sands tankers through the Puget Sound uh, every year, almost a tanker a day. Those tankers would be traveling near Washington communities. If they spilled, uh, well, they'd be on the U.S. and Canadian side of the border. But you know, honestly, an oil spill doesn't really care which side of the border it's on. So those projects directly affect us here in Washington. But because of that border, you don't get a lot of communication. So on the one hand, it's a big challenge. Uh, on the other hand, it's a huge opportunity because folks in the Northwest at the grassroots level have begun to have a really unprecedented level of coordination. Instead of fighting these projects one by one, both from groups like 350 and the work that Rising Tide, which has the opportunity because we have Rising Tide chapters on both sides of the border. There are collectives up in Vancouver and the Coast Salish territories. There are collectives here in Washington. There are collectives out in Oregon. We have a unique opportunity because because we're all volunteer and we're not tied to these funders to talk about these projects in, um, in, in totality and look at the cumulative impacts of all of this. So we're putting together a mapping project which analyzes all of these projects. We're gonna be launching a website shortly uh, called nunshellpass.org. It's not online yet, but it will hopefully be up in the next few months. And that'll have a uh, constantly updated uh, wiki, which will be showing what projects are online, what's been defeated, and what you can do to take action on the projects in your local community. So that'll be a resource source to help people get a better perspective on the totality of this, uh, along with a mapping project, which will be both in a physical form and online that folks will be able to take a look at and see you know, as projects pop up and as they're defeated, what is actually on the landscape. And that's why I say about 25 projects, because, you know, like I said, a few months ago, there were, you know, six oil terminal or sorry, six coal export terminals on the table. Now there are three. Um, you know, and prior to six, seven months ago, there weren't 10 coal export terminals proposed in the Northwest. So these things are constantly being proposed, being defeated. A new proposal comes to the table. So it's changing. And that's why we're using that crowdsourcing way, that wiki to monitor these projects. Will you also be sharing what the uh the strategies were for uh, the defeat of the different projects? Because that seems like that's a key piece to relay. To uh, well, it, it, the strategies are happening at every level, basically. I mean, so from everything from giving testimony at hearings, we know, for example, uh, some of the coal uh, terminals had to be approved through the Department of Ecology. So people showed up en masse to give testimony um, against the coal terminals. <laughs> Um, to civil disobedience, absolutely. We've got things, you know, not only the uh, the pledge of resistance going, but there's also, you know, sort of plans in the works for uh, civil disobedience uh, on any number of um, uh, of the projects. And there have already been people who've been getting arrested in Oregon. You probably heard about this with the uh, mega loads going from Oregon up into Canada to the tar sands developments. So, you know. Really, it's everything. I mean, there's going to be lots of letter writing. There's going to be petition signing. There's going to be sort of, you know, political pressure of that kind. Um, and then there's going to be lots of people showing up and putting their bodies on the line and maybe risking arrest and, you know, uh, everything like that. So. Yeah, and, and I want to speak a, a little bit more about the direct action and civil disobedience component of that, because uh, direct action is a, a core value and um, and tactic used by the Rising Tide Network all over the world. Um, and it's another thing that we've really seen 
um, a shift that the Keystone fight has caused in the environmental movement is the number of people around the country talking about the need for direct action, physically using one's body in a civil disobedient or nonviolent way to block the construction or facilitation of some of these projects. Um, and I think that's for, for a couple of reasons. One, um, the campaign against Keystone has very prominently and very successfully used both symbolic civil disobedience at the White House and other places, as well as more direct physical blockading and impediments down in the southern leg of the Keystone Pipeline um, to great success to delay this project for the last five years. But also, you know, as people in this country become more and more concerned about the real existential threat of climate change, um, you know, the fact that we're headed towards a four degree or a six degree Celsius increase in average global temperatures. And what that means is a world in which a large amount of the landmass is physically too hot to live in, on, a world that is radically different in a way that uh, our society would look nothing like it looks like today. And people become really concerned with this existential threat. The act of signing a petition or making a phone call to Congress and forgetting about it really doesn't seem to be a response that is commensurate with the actual threat we are facing. Uh, and people are really looking for a way to make a more bold and more um, appropriate response to the, the threats of climate change and the, the impacts that these projects are having directly right now, even, you know, on people's lives. Uh, and direct action provides an avenue for people to feel that in, in a real tangible way that is strategic and is effective. Um, and I just, I know Emily is, is eager to jump in here, but I just want to say one more thing is um, when we look at things like the, um, the tar sands blockade, down in Texas and Oklahoma that for two months delayed the construction of the southern leg of the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, one, we see a very successful action in terms of a massive delay in that project, costing TransCanada millions of dollars in lost profits in additional construction and security costs. And also, these direct action campaigns build some of the most beautiful, unique, and unlikely coalitions. The tar sands blockade down in East Texas was a coalition of students and environmentals and radicals from from uh, the University of Texas and from Austin who teamed up with Tea Party groups and landowners and small ranchers in East Texas and together stood side by side and Tea Party members locked on with anarchists from the University of Texas to blockade construction equipment coming into a local landowner, a local rancher's land in East Texas. And these beautiful coalitions are what is actually the key to beating these projects. And it provides an opportunity when we focus on these impacts, when we focus on the communities that are on the front lines of these projects, an opportunity to build these coalitions which don't really happen elsewhere and which are really unthinkable in other circumstances circumstances. Uh, and that coalition, that project, the Tar Sands Blockade, was thrown together in a matter of a couple of months by students from East Texas and, uh, and the University of Texas. And it had a massive impact. It cost these companies millions of dollars. It, it delayed the project for months. Up here in the Northwest, we have years before many of these projects will finally finish going through environmental review. We have two to three years to build the infrastructure to do a tar sands blockade style action, to set up a permanent blockade of one of these projects, and to do that on a scale that is so much larger and so much impressive than any more impressive than anything the fossil fuel industry has seen so far. I mean, if they could get hundreds of people down to to a permanent action camp in the dregs of East Texas in a hot summer. Uh, imagine what we could do in Bellingham with three years of preparation. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. We're talking with Adam Gaia and Emily Johnson. Adam with uh, Rising Tide Seattle and Emily with 350 Seattle. How can people find out more about your organizations? 350seattle.org. 
Um, you can check out risingtidenorthamerica.org, or you can find Rising Tide Seattle on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Rising Tide Seattle. All right. Well, with that, we're enforcing out of time. I want to thank you very much for both coming in this morning and talking to us. Thank you.